Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today uh, on BizTalk APA's online series discussing business topics relevant to the photo community. I'm Natter Corey, a San Francisco photographer and uh, board member of APA. Um, uh, today, um, you know, we have a panel here of uh, different uh, folks from the production community. Um, you know, we as an industry are uh, problem solvers and we wanted to bring people on to talk about uh, how they're sol solving problems now in productions and, and how we're preparing to solve problems in the future. Um, so, you know, thinking about it like working with a client and they have uh, challenges and we're focusing on providing solutions. Uh, with that said, um, you know, everyone out there, you know, gave us some great uh, questions and, you know, people are looking for some guidelines for best practices. Um, I just want to make it clear, you know, we're, this, this is, uh, you know, there aren't any set guidelines for the, our community yet. And uh, this is kind of a work in progress. And we're, we're highlighting some of uh, the stories around all of these individuals and, and what they're going through right now uh, to, uh, you know, make things happen. So uh, just, just a little bit of note to kind of take things with a grain of salt and uh, understand that this is an ongoing discussion. Um, so I have Juliet Wolf Robin, the executive director of uh, APA National, uh, on on the line with us, and she'll be uh, taking a look at your questions. Um, make sure to uh, put all the questions in the Q and A instead of the uh, uh, instead of the chat. Uh, so. Yeah, and let me just say that the a lot of the we did receive a lot of questions already, so we may or may not get to the additional questions that are here. But we will um, we'll be posting in the chat area links. We'll provide them in the email that'll go out after this, and we will uh, be continuing conversation. So if things don't get answered today, we will uh, look to answer them in the future. Great, great. So I just wanted to quickly uh, introduce everybody. Uh, I'm just going to go through everyone's names and give a little bit of a sense of uh, where you're coming from. Uh, Samantha Isom, uh, I, sorry, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yeah. Uh, you're, uh, she's a photographer, director, uh, uh, DP, and camera operator based out of New York, and uh, you, creator of the online journal and travel show brownpassport.com. And uh, she is teaming up with a OSHA professional to create a training to help photography productions uh, be COVID-19 compliant. Uh, we have Jim Baldwin, uh, uh, who's, hi Jim, who's from the Bay Area. Uh, Jim's been a scout uh, managing locations in the Bay Area since, wow, 1987. He has worked with agent uh, Heather Elder to establish Create in Place, a service that is connecting creators with buyers during shelter in place and as we emerge. Uh, then we have executive producer Monica Zeffirano, yes, okay, <laughs> uh, from uh, Tribe Production Collective, uh, and sh she's interested in getting the discussion going um, uh, amongst the production community about keeping crews safe uh, once we as an industry can uh, work again. Uh, she produces worldwide and works as a local in LA and Chicago markets. Um, and your tribe is also a leader in advocating sustainable eco-friendly sets. And then we have uh, R.C. Rivera, uh, who's also uh, another uh, APA SF board member and photographer and director. Uh, these days, it's, it's like we need to create a word that includes photographer director, like phone director or something like that. <laughs> um, well, acronym or something. <laughs> an acronym. An imaging specialist based in SF uh, and Manila, Philippines. He photographs people, places, and things that, in the beauty and sports lifestyle world, uh, sport lifestyle world, clients include Puma, Adidas, Fitbit, Google, Fenty Beauty, Marc Jacobs Beauty, Sephora, UFC, and how do you say it? Amazfit or and then for him. Amazfit, yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, thanks everybody for joining us. Really excited to um, hear some of your stories. Um, I thought we'd we'd begin it uh, by the the now the present and uh, kind of hear from both Jim and RC um, about 
what kinds of things they're doing now to, um, you know, work with the limitations that we've been given to actually uh, produce. Um, RC, do you want to start off kind of giving us uh, a little bit of a sense? Um, I, I, one of the, I mean, you're a great photographer. I always look up to your work, but one of the things that I noticed is that you had, you just worked on a shoot recently, which was interesting. Can you just give us a little synopsis of what that was like? Uh, yeah. So, um, you know, I have um, an in-house client that um, we usually shoot about once or twice a month. And, um, the you know, obviously we skipped uh, the March shoot because uh, the stay in place in California, um, you know, happened then. And, um, but we, you know, they were, you know, like us uh, photographers and everybody else, uh, clients are trying to, you know, look for creative ways of shooting. So we, uh, you know, we had pitched this idea that we, they, they still needed a content and um, they approached me if I could do a still life shoot and, um, you know, what, how, how that was going to happen. And uh, long story short, we designed kind of a, a, a remote shooting scenario where we had, um, you know, utilizing Zoom and utilizing um, um, remote desktop software and, uh, um, you know, the multiple camera angles by, by, that Zoom allows. Um, so we set up a remote desktop. So my digital tech was working from home. Um, that he was, and that he was able to uh, control the computer, my, my my capture machine, and then I was obviously working by myself. I told the clients, you know, what to expect uh, because I'm working by myself. Your shot count is going to be a lot lower. <laughs> so, um, you know, if you guys can 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 if they can bear with that, then we can make this happen. Um, and then I had my my assistant, um, my PA, basically, uh, you know, on, and the clients all in a Zoom chat. And then I had set up um, additional users for Zoom so I could have um, different camera angles for the set. So I had one camera that was um, positioned above the camera, went above um, like a wider view of the set. And that allowed the clients to kind of be on the shoot. You know, they could see what I was doing. And obviously I was also styling some of the shots. It was very simple um, uh, still life shoot, but um, there was one shot that needed a lot of rigging and obviously I would have loved to have uh, my uh, prop stylist there, but um, yeah, we uh, basically, we, we found ways to kind of streamline it so that the clients could still be on the shoot and have um, views of what was happening. And then my digital tech, because one of the shots needed um, um, compositing as I was shooting because it was a fairly complex shot. He was able to, um, you know, process and control the uh, the, the uh, capture one and output it, and then grab the files because we had a Dropbox shared folder between my computer and his, and he was outputting and receiving the files on his end at the same time. Sorry, did you mention the retoucher? You saw. Yeah, so I had a dig digital tech that was working with me, and then also a, a retoucher that was kind of um, comp uh, compositing some of the shots as we as we went. Mm -hmm. Right. So you, you kind of, I think you told me about one scenario where you had your hands full and uh, your digital tech was basically shooting right for you because he had control of your computer. Yes. So yeah, the, the digital tech bit, having a remote desktop software between our machines. Um, well, for one shot, I had to be holding a reflector and then one, um, one light <laughs> in my hand. So I had to, it was, you know, I forgot about it, but we I basically was like, Hey, um, you know, Ben, can you shoot? Because he was, uh, you know, your keyboard commands still work. So he was actually able to help me help me out in shooting. Um, and it actually worked pretty well. Nice. The only thing that uh, that slowed us down was the, you know, it does take a lot of bandwidth. So um, um, the, the whole setup, uh, having, uh, you know, Zoom and uh, multiple people on the, on the chat and having different camera angles, um, the I couldn't have any music <laughs> because my Spotify was not working. <laughs> oh. Yeah, so you got to watch out with your RAM. Make sure yeah. you obviously have a beefed up computer. Yeah. Um, that that's great. I, I mean, so you know, thinking about all this, like you know, Zoom, we we everyone uses it, and in, in a way, you know, you think, oh, there's probably got to be some other program, right? That's that's like just the Zoom Premium or something. <laughs> I mean, it, Zoom seems like a pretty good thing to still be able to use, right? It's, like you said, you can set up multiple cameras. Are there, have you noticed any other solutions that 
are available out there? Not at the moment. Um, you know, Zoom right now worked really well for the for the for the for the for the shoot because, um, like I said, I set up uh, some different users. So I had a I had two spare iPads and I had one spare phone, and I set those up as as different camera or users and different camera angles. So I had, um, you know, like I said, the, the the clients could actually pick a camera view and look at it so see what was happening because I had one, you know, on on top of the camera as a camera view and one as an overall set. So that was nice. And um, what Zoom allows you to do is a, um, you know, to share screens. So you can, you can have multiple screens or multiple programs open, but you can actually just select your capture one or whatever it is you want to share a PDF. So as we went, I was getting approvals and, um, you know, showing them what was happening on, on capture one, an overlay, just like if they were standing right beside you. Right. Um, and, you know, the, there's a little bit of that um, question of, when you give clients that Zoom uh, opportunity, it may get thrown into multiple sets of layers of approvals. Uh, did was there any kind of slowdown more than usual if they were as if more than if they were on set? Not necessarily. It was you know we had one point that the creative director was in New York and uh, a few of the team members were in LA and San Francisco and. You know, when they needed, when we needed him to approve something, we just pinged him, texted him, somebody sent him a message, hey, can you log into the shoot? We had this, uh, you know, like a Zoom um, set up uh, for, the, for the whole entire day. So anybody from the company, the client side, and on my team could actually just, you know, log out or log in when they needed. Um, how, was, how was a remote desktop to set up? Is that kind of a, was that a long process for you? I think you told me you already had it set up from before, but. Yeah, I already, I already have it set up because I have uh, my server on the my studio um, set up so I can access it anywhere in the world as long mm -hmm. as I have an internet connection. Mm -hmm. um, I set it up a long time uh, ago like that. But um, yeah, it's actually fairly simple to set up. Um, um, Apple has a built-in remote desktop, but there's a lot of other um, software out there that just allows you to um, basically think of it as a, if you had a support problem with whatever it is, internet provider or you know, a computer program, they, they, they ask you to, um, if they can control your computer. I don't know, most of us probably know how to use our, our machines, but uh, you know, some, some, if the, I, I remember having a support problem with um, Comcast a long time ago and they asked if they could see, you know, your screen and, and that's the same kind of software that you would use. Right, right. Yeah. There's a nice. question for RC specifically from somebody asking if you've ever considered using Adobe Creative Cloud or Adobe Rush? For sharing files, um, is that uh, I guess the, what, what that meeting, uh, what that question is referring to, maybe a um, uh, for sharing files. Uh, I find that Dropbox is a little faster, so that's uh, what I uh, what I use. Um, but I, I honestly, I've, I've I've played with Creative Cloud before, but not as um, in this situation. Mm -hmm. Nice. Well, any other things you wanted to add on that, or? Uh, no, not in the moment. Okay, cool. Good stuff. I hope that's helpful for people. I know it makes me feel a little more uh, empowered, confident. Um, hey, so Jim, um, yeah, tell us a little about uh, Create in Place, um, you know, how it's being received. Uh, and, you know, I guess just give us a little bit of a background on why, why you started it. Being received very well. Um, we're, we created Create in Place just for opportunities like uh, RCs. Uh, and we're trying to give all of you guys the exposure to the client side. The clients know that there are people who are able to shoot in their own homes with their own people uh, under shelter in place conditions, but they don't know the details about what's they, how to find those people, what is at each individual's house, and who is available as talent. So what we've done is put all of this online so that the clients can actually come and, and either ask us about specifics uh, or just browse through a collection of creators and see who might be the most appropriate for their particular assignment. Mm -hmm. uh, nice. Um, so just give us a sense of how it works. Uh, photographers, like how many photographers are involved in it right now? Currently, we have 35 uh, creators on the site. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we just added another one in the last uh, hour. Mm -hmm. So they're coming in 
couple a day, so anywhere from two to four per day. Wow. It's been it's been an interesting whirlwind of a three week idea. Uh, I had been calling around to some of my photographers to see if a concept like this was even something that they thought there might be a market for. And uh, Hunter Freeman actually put me in touch with uh, Heather Elder, his rep. And Heather had, because they'd just been talking about that within their particular group, uh, I wanted to do something for a broad swath of photographers, make these opportunities available to, to anybody. And Heather had already been thinking about it. And of course, Heather has a great distribution channel on the client side because that's what she does as a rep. Uh, which I didn't have because I'm a production guy. And we decided right away within five minutes that we were going to partner on this and make it reality. And within a week, we had, uh, I think, uh, probably 15 people up and a beta version out that we were farming out to a few clients and they seemed to like it. They gave us some feedback and we've just been rolling with the feedback and making the changes from there. So it's been a very fast process and uh, the response has been terrific. Nice. So it's ba it's basically a lot of uh, you know shelter in place. So it's it's people's families that may be in the helping them as stylists and that kind of thing. Um, and any other kind of sense of what some of these requests are looking like that are coming in? I mean, the requests, as they always are, are all over the place. Um, I've never known from week to week as a location scout where I'm going to be going or what I'm going to be looking for because every assignment is different. Similarly with all of our assignments, uh, everybody's trying to come up with something new and um, eye-catching. So you don't know, we don't know if people are going to be looking for backyards or kitchen or um, ethnically diverse children from a certain age group, for example, everybody's got different priorities. So the idea for us is to just put everything out there so that people can get a sense of what might be available. You know, are, is there, does somebody have a trained animal, for example? Does somebody have farm animals? Does somebody have a swimming pool where you could shoot in the water? Um, mm -hmm. We just don't know. So the requests have been coming in um, in a very broad, diverse way. Some of them very specific. And in some cases, we're uh, going through the resource, the photographic resources, the creator resources, and sending out individual portfolios as a way to cut to the chase. And in other cases, the clients are looking through the entire site and browsing on their own. Right. I'm sure there's kind of a little bit of a, a lot of these clients are, are still in the, in the, creative wise, really trying to figure out how to relate to, to potential, uh, you know, their audience uh, right now. So is there any coaching involved of, 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 of clients of how to really make it translate? Coaching of clients? No, we let the clients okay. tell us what Got it is it. That they would like to do. Um, yeah. we, are, we are coaching the creators through the presentation process, trying to not standardize things, but at least format things in a way that's recognizable and similar similar across the different creators mm -hmm. um, so that we just have uh, an idea of what's available now versus what has been available in the past offsite, for example. Um, it's mm -hmm. been a really it's, it's been a really interesting couple of weeks for me formatting these pages and getting everything up online and um, mm -hmm. it's happening at a great clip every day. I mean, it's right. really been wonderful. The response from the creator side has been great. You know, we have so many diverse people out there with diverse points of view and they all live in different circumstances. Um, some people have studio resources just across town. Some people have ranches in Colorado and Montana. Uh, you just never know. And everybody has, of course, a house, a place to live. Some people live with stylists. For example, some people live with art directors, some people live with fashion models. So everything's different. And somebody's asking, anybody who's interested can contact you? I put in your link on the chat. In, in the yes, chat. anyone who's interested can contact us. We are definitely, um, we're being selective about the photographers that we're presenting. We're looking for, you know, people who are working in groups like this one, uh, who are recognized professionals with established track records. Uh, and once we see that 
that that sort of vetting process has been passed through, then we start getting people onboarded. Nice. We're trying to keep the, the caliber of the work as high as possible, but at the same time, um, allow for a diversity of um, opportunities and price ranges for the clients. Right, right. Nice. Well, thanks, Jim. Uh, uh, it's great to hear what you're doing. And, uh, you know, work is still happening. <laughs> work is definitely happening. I mean, as you see with RC, it's, it's really, uh, it's, a, it, it's a whole new way of looking at how to get this work done. Um, the, what we were trying to, what we're trying to provide an option for is how people like RC and the other creators actually find these clients and how the clients find them. So we figured we have power in numbers uh, mm -hmm. rather than swamping agencies with individual phone calls as everybody will do. Of course, everyone's self-marketing. We provided a forum in which we can group together a lot of different people and, and get our message out. Right. Uh, I, one of the questions in the registration was around, have you, done, have you worked on a shoot um, in the past few months? And I would say about 15 to 20% of the photographers said they did worked on a like, client shoot, which you know, feels a little bit low, but um, you know, it's, it's, I feel like what you're doing is, uh, we can bring those percentages up, I guess, right? <laughs> uh, I think so. I think we already have. You know, we've had, we've landed several shoots already, um, and they've been all very different. We've had some photographers out in the field shooting now. We have certainly have a number of estimates in process, and it's really, the response has been great, and it seems to have just taken off. Um, hopefully, this won't be a service that's needed for very long. <laughs> <laughs> We would like, this is, this is put together as a way of working right now. Uh, and we hope that it just helps people get through this particularly difficult time where there's just no money. I mean, I, as of March 12th, as a location scout, I was absolutely out of business. Um, and so I did what I think almost all of us have done. I cleaned up everything on my computer. I cleaned up everything in my office. I started cleaning up everything in my house until my head was clear and I could find an idea. And this just seemed to make a lot of sense. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, uh, oh, uh, we did get one question about uh, what's the best way to follow up with clients or prospects uh, or during this work stoppage. And I, I mean, this is this sounds like a, a, a good way to get it out there as well. Um, but uh, any other things you want to add, Jim? Um, but I think. Well. We did this as a way of getting everybody back to work. We really hope to generate some connections and some work for everyone. That's the whole goal of this project is just to make sure that people know where to go to connect. Um, as a location scout, I'm a connector. As a rep, uh, Heather is definitely a huge connector. And that's what we're trying to do, just connect people together to make something happen. And somebody asked if any of the work's been published yet. Oh, no. Not yet. Published? Yeah. No, I, I don't think so, no. Uh, it's, I mean, people have just been shooting as of, I think, last Friday was the first shoot day that we had online. Um, yeah, so, mine was last week, so uh, we're still working on retouching. <laughs> and then the question yeah. also was, uh, do you have any issues on getting permits and shooting outside? Oh, absolutely. One cannot get permits in most places now uh, because one cannot get insurance for those permits, which of course is required for everything that's not on your own private property. And that's been one of the, that's been one of the things that we've been trying to find a workaround for us. If you can't get insurance, then you can't get permits, then you can't legally be on, on public lands or on even somebody else's private location because they, of course, would require your insurance. Um, the coverage just isn't there. So we think that the option is to shoot at home so that you're already safe and stay sheltered. And there was another question for you on the pay. Uh, do you find that clients are asking for a lower rate or would it be the same rate it would have been otherwise for the type of shoot? Well, the clients are always asking for a lower rate, aren't they? You know, that's, that's how it always goes. Uh, what I'm finding, and again, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a financial forecaster, but I'm definitely anticipating that budgets are gonna feel a lot of downward pressure 
because advertising money has dried up as business has fallen off. Uh, the economic forecast for the next several months is quite gloomy, as we all know. And uh, one of the first things, as we've also discovered in, in past crises, is that advertising budgets are some of the first to be cut. Um, we're hoping that the creators are going to hold to their existing rates um, so that we don't see a recurrence of what happened between 2008 and 2010, where there was something of a race to the bottom from which a lot of people only recently recovered. So we're really hoping that the fact that the expenses are going to be so much lower is actually going to satisfy the needs of the downward budget pressures. But well, we'll you know, I mean, also in the case with you, RC, uh, you, you were basically playing stylist on set. Show. Yeah. yeah, so in a way, they should be paying you more, right? Because you're <laughs> playing stylist as well. Um, it was, yeah, it's true. I, I, you know, and I, what I forgot to mention a while ago was yeah, um, I, I did have a few other clients that, that came up, and I'm not going to mention any names, but um, we had to walk away from two jobs because uh, they were essentially asking for a huge discount. But uh, yeah, as we talked about it yesterday, I, you know, it, it, I was doing two to three other people's roles in the shoot. And, you know, even though the shot count is going to be lower and the del deliverables are going to be lower, I, it was, it was a lot of work actually, it's, you know, trying to figure out how to do everything, how to be able to deliver to the clients at the same, you know, kind of quality of work. It was, it was a difficult process. And, and, you know, just the, out of respect for the stay in place for, you know, uh, you didn't, we didn't really want to inundate Amazon or whoever it is that, you know, we use for, um, uh, you know, sourcing props. So we, uh, I had to, I had to, um, I contacted a few prop stylists to see if they had any access to um, props that already already had in their, 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 you know, their, their, their studios or whatever, just so that we didn't have to really order new things from, you know, from Amazon or whatever it is, because mm -hmm. as we know, Amazon is limiting a lot of their shipments just to mm -hmm. the essentials to a lot of people. So just I mean, that, for that. That sounded like an interesting idea is to offer consulting from whether it's a prop stylist or, you know, producer, or et cetera, for, for working. They may not be able to be on set, but they can maybe even, I think you mentioned they could be on the Zoom call and they can kind of give you tips on, <laughs> on styling, you know, to, cause, but, and, and, you know, the other question I'm having is, is how, where do we go from what you're explaining to, you know, actually being able to have a production and the having the making sure the clients aren't kind of abusing you, all the hard work you're doing. Um, and, and, uh, especially we don't want you getting sick, right? Like you need to actually slow down and like not exert yourself as much because right now, you know, your immune system needs to be strong. And, and it sounds like you're probably working even harder than you usually would be. Do you feel like that was the case? Well, no, I'm working harder at home with my kids. <laughs> <laughs> I, I saw the, uh, I saw the, uh, the work as a little break from my, my kids. So that's uh, uh, Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. Cool. You know what I've experienced, what we experienced in our uh, first shoot on Friday when I spoke with a photographer actually this morning is that one of the hardest things is they don't have, you guys don't have an assistant. So you're accustomed to asking for a lens, holding out your right hand and finding the lens in your hand. And that's just not happening. No. That's the kind of work. Put the kids to work. Put the kids to work. <laughs> you definitely put the kids to work. Uh, you definitely want to give them some training so they don't drop that beautiful lens of yours, you know, yeah. or you yeah. might get someone to getting to someone to light something just the way you want. I mean, these are all these are all things that do require practice. Um, when I talk about the lowering of expenses, I'm thinking primarily of things like hotels airfare, client meals, client dinners, all of those things that in a remote situation, one no longer has to account for in the budget. So it, you know, it's not a matter of necessarily driving down expenses, certainly not with fees, um, but expenses for maybe possibly rentals and other things, and crew members certainly may be lower unless you can bring in a stylist to consult across Zoom on the outside but a lot of incidental expenses that have to do with the client side are going to be almost non-existent. Yeah. Okay, well, I, I wanna move, um, let's get moving on to, you know, thinking more about future and uh, 
you know, I, I want to start with you, Monica, just about on the producer level, you know, what kinds of conversations you're having, you know, we've heard about, you know, I've heard producers feel a lot of the responsibility for people's safety, you know, obviously, you know, everyone's responsible. Um, but, you know, how, how do you think producers can adapt to this? And there's, there's lots of ideas being thrown around. Um, you want to give us a kind of little summary yeah. of what you're... As, as much as, as I can, certainly. Um, I've been paying attention, uh, getting on Zoom calls, uh, uh, listening to podcasts about how our industry is going to change. But the, the most important thing is getting back to work. First of all, back to you, Jim. I've been out of work since this all started, just like all my colleagues. Um, and yes, we've, we've taken time to organize everything in our life. And it would be nice to have some semblance of normalcy getting back to work. I have estimated a couple jobs uh, for the distant future whenever it is safe to travel, as well as a Zoom, a virtual photo shoot. Um, and those have all been interesting. But most importantly, we producers are the ones that are going to be responsible. Like if we are involved in a shoot, it's ultimately up to us to keep the health and safety guidelines upheld. So the things that, um, you know, once we get back to, there's a, there's a couple prongs here. Uh, as an example, this uh, a, a shoot that I recently um, estimated again for down the road, whenever travel bans are lifted and when it's, there's some sort of semblance of safety getting back to, um, small shoots, uh, it, you know, really is cutting out all the fluff. Like you said, Jim, uh, cutting out all the fluff. We're no longer going to have this massive catering spread. You know, we have to think about all the ways that we need to bring safety and, and uh, health of our crew into play. And that would be single use, like prepackaged snacks, prepackaged meals, um, having a safety officer, uh, whether that, you know, in today's environment, I don't know if we could even get a medic uh, available to us to come to set, but having having a set medic, having somebody that's that's adhering, watching watching, and at, and being able to ask, be have people come and ask questions of, um, but making sure the safety measures are complied with on set. So having a dedicated person for that, um, you know, everything. Uh, the 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 example that I recently estimated was uh, a small traveling crew, photographer, digital tech slash assistant, and me, and that's it. And maybe one client would come, but no bells and whistles. We would primarily see if we could drive the set to be outside, out of doors, in backyards, like you said, Jim, uh, ideally uh, eliminating all risk, as much risk as we possibly can. Um, I think it's very important to things to think about when you're having a department go in, a hair and makeup go in to touch up. Only the bare necessity, like children, if we can get away with no hair and makeup for children, skip that. But like uh, I was estimating for like a grandparent and a kid. So having them go in, everybody else pull back. So keeping that six foot distance. Uh, and then if our department needed to go in, if our department was even a part of it. And in this instant, they were not. We had to make, a, make amends. We had to uh, decide what was the very bare necessity to make this thing happen. So, so ultimately, um, you know, it does fall on to, uh, if, if a photographer has a producer, it ultimately falls on our shoulders to make sure that we are creating a safe set for our crew, for our talent, um, and do it in the, in the safest way. And we, you know, we're all speculating on how this is going to go down, but I do feel that there's going to be these safe, certain safety measures that would not be smart if we didn't follow and keep them in play for quite a while. Uh, and that is limiting the amount of people. I do feel that we're not going to have as many clients coming to set as we have in the past, which is not a bad thing. <laughs> um, we've got, uh, you know, I've got digital techs, uh, just got hit up with uh, last night, a, a digital tech that's creating this similar to what you have RC with your guy. Um, so you can remote shoot, you can get, you can get wardrobe approved ahead of time you can get all kinds of decisions made via zoom uh with that technology um i think that wardrobe for example uh should be shopped should be assumed that we're purchasing everything we buy so there's no returns happening right so a wardrobe stylist could essentially prep a job do the mood boards full scale and then ship the clothing to wherever it needs to go and those and the, the clothing would not be returned 
So certain measures, I think costs will go up to a certain degree. I think we need to assume that we're going to have to have like a lo whatever location, if it's a, you know, if it's a porch of a house, if it's, if it's uh, a part of a house, um, you've got to go in and make it sanitary before you come in and when you leave. So there's certain added costs that we're going to have to include in our future bids. Uh, of course, then the travel, we'll have less people coming to set. We'll have, you know, so there, I think it'll all scale out. And I don't think that, God, I hope that this is not a time where clients will try to push numbers down, especially for fees and such. Right. Yeah, I certainly um, hope not. I mean, one of the things we're, that's, we're talking about future shoots. Um, the option that, we're, that we've put together is about getting people out in the field as soon as tomorrow. So this wasn't this something that we put together for a, a matter of the, you know months from now after shelter in place is over. Um, we're hoping that can, I, I mean I'm specifically trying to address the need for additional styling and all of that. For example, we're hoping that one of the ancillary effects of all this might be um, advertisers and agency people looking very closely at their styling needs versus the authenticity and genuineness of actually shooting in someone's house where all of that stuff exists. Mm -hmm. We're hoping that the clients may very well adapt some of their concepts to the existing resources rather than trying to put forth an idea and then see who can accomplish it. It's just a different sort of, you know, turn the option around. And to that, just a little, you know, added, I, that will, will, that is time. That's time for a producer to be on a call. That's time for a photographer to be on a Zoom call. Right. We, we take a look, talk about what they have. And, you know, so there's, there's some front end loaded time that needs to be accounted for, for right. that, you know, if we go that direction, certainly. Okay. Well, okay. So I, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, where we're at, where we're not able to actually shoot right now, but Lots of different industries obviously are in, you know, grocery stores, everyone, like the economy is happening. People are actually working. And, uh, and of course, how can we learn from them? And, but, and, and this is where I want to get you in on the discussion, Samantha, is, uh, you know, what do we do when they come on set? Do they need to take a test the day before? Are, are there, well, number one, are there tests even available? They, you know, and you know, are the, are we taking people's temperatures before they come on set? And and you know, are we going to need some kind of standards? Uh, and you know, because there's going to be large shoots, there's going to be small shoots, and th there's it's complicated. We're you know, I'm shooting food. That's different than you know shooting models. And uh, you know, so where do we kind of go from like where we think w what we think we should do? And, and then taking advice of all the, you know, experts to, you know, like maybe the extreme or, you know what I'm saying? Like, wh where do we begin? I, for me, if I, it's okay to speak now, I guess. Yeah, I got <laughs> for, for me, I would say training is crucial because everybody has, Smuggler has their, their sheet out. Um, AICP came out with their sheet. Producers are thankfully putting together, thank you, Monica and other producers, their own safety sheets out. But, you know, when I worked at some other jobs, we had to do OSHA training, even if it was basic. Yet it was mostly industrial environments. So you're talking about safety on a ladder or safety with machinery or safety with electrical, things of that nature. But if you're working, say, in you know, a dentist office or a facility like that, you're talking about infection control safety in conjunction with those other safety concerns. I think the more we're trained, the less fear we're gonna have. And I think the, the better trained we are, the more equipped we are at understanding how to adapt that knowledge to our environment and to make everyone safe based on that, not just based on everybody's different research online or everybody's different, everything's just so different. I think trying to come up with a standard as some other industries have, quite frankly, we could use. You know, I'm not going to wait for the government to decide for me. I mean, they haven't even, we're primarily non-union. I mentioned this uh, prior to our Zoom chat where a lot of unions have their standards in place, but non-union doesn't really have that, not to that degree. And I think it's time. And why wait until we get a union if that even ever happens? Or why wait until the government says, this is what you have to do? Why even wait, frankly, for the insurance companies are still confused 
to come up with something. I think it's up to us to be proactive, start training each other, in the, or not each other, excuse me, start taking training that comes from professionals that really have a better understanding of how disease is transmitted. You know, the basics, the epidemiology of this. What, what are we really dealing with besides why, what kind of masks do I wear and why is that? When you start understanding why, you're, there's a lot less fear involved and decisions aren't made just haphazardly, but they're made um, with intelligent intention, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Did you put your link up for your Thursday talk? What's that? Did you put your link up for your Thursday talk? Uh, not yet. I, I need to do that, actually. I will. And yeah, I get so excited about talking. <laughs> yeah, you know what? We can add it to the email that goes out to uh, after this. So everybody okay. gets the email, so we can put it in that. But there was a question yesterday that came up about um, should makeup artists be licensed, uh, the makeup artists that you use. So do you feel that people, everybody should be licensed for what they're working on? Or how do you, how do you see that role going forward? I personally do, it may not be as popular, but I do. I feel like the more proof you have of a certain level of education, the more on the same page everybody is, and the more that you kind of just have a basic knowledge. This is why I mentioned unions before, like IATSE, IATSE, however you like to pronounce that. You know, they have a certain set of standards and you have to go through a certain course before you get the card. We don't have that yet, but something like makeup artists being licensed, I think is it's kind of basic, but that still doesn't really, um, account for infection control training. Well, I think, so, you know, oh, sorry, when we, I was talking to you, Samantha, you made the comparison of Capture One certification, right? When yeah, oh, that's right. You were right telling me how you were doing digital teching before yeah, digital way teching before exact, existed, <laughs> yeah. right? <laughs> and, you know, yeah. you have somebody that's Capture One certified and then somebody that's not, but knows it really well. And mm -hmm. you don't have any recommendations for like, from any of from your colleagues about who to work with, and you probably are going to go with the person who has that Capture One certification, right? And I did run into that actually. I mean, I started on the computer. My first seminar was in '97, and then I started working before we called it digital tech in '99. You know, in Chicago on products on camera systems that no longer exist, obviously. But at that, you know, after a while, when it started to become standard in our non-union side of the business to have a capture one certification that people did ask me that a lot. And I thought, well, I guess I better go get this now, even though um, I was definitely educated enough to work as a digital tech, but that was something that people held, wait, it's not a government card. Again, it's not anything like that, but what it was, was a certification that just people accepted as an under, that you have a basic understanding or a certain level of understanding how to work in that capacity, how to, how, to, um, how to be in that role, you know? And I feel like with this, it's even more important. I mean, it's one thing, you know, of course, you don't want somebody on who's teching for you who's gonna lose files. But I mean, I think it's more important as far as our health is concerned, that we're trained. This is again, not something that our side of the industry has, has been used to, but in some other industries, even if you're a receptionist at a desk in a dentist office, you have to have a basic level of knowledge or certain things in regarding infection control, or what are you doing in there? I mean, you're working in an environment that's potentially dangerous with that. Can you? Know? you and now us, we are, so I feel like we should have that training. Can you give us a little bit of sense of what people can expect on your training in the sense of, you know, are you gonna be saying, do this and this and this, you know, um, you know, someone just said, um, if somebody, you know, what kind of, protocol to have when if somebody actually has a high temperature like uh on set you know like it and one and once you know that you know who's going to have to abide by that and what if the cost for that you know what are going to be the costs like besides having a medic you know um on on set i mean personally if somebody if you're starting to take temp like with the uh touchless uh, thermometers if you're taking temperatures on the way and first of all there is asymptomatic transmission. So that only handles a certain level or certain degree of potential transmission anyway. So the basics are treat everyone as though they're infectious, period. You know, so you're all take, going through your protocol as if you are maybe not as far as a dentist, but to a certain degree, yes. You know, treating everyone as though they, they potentially could infect you because the truth is they could, even if they had a test 
at a 70% as of today accuracy rate on the, the diagnostic test, there's still a 30% chance that person could still transmit the disease to you, even though they didn't test positive on a COVID test. So why, you know, now we're talking about temperature. That's the next level. If they have a temperature, they should not be on set. If they feel at all sick, you should not be coming to set, period. And then now if we're taking your temperature on the way in, it's no offense to you. I love you. We, we love our health. Go home. That's it. Right. You know, I mean, I'm sorry, but it's just not the kind of a situation. I know that we are used to working sometimes in environments where I've done it myself. I've been guilty in some years past, you know, as an assistant. Oh, my God, I have a cold. I'll just cover it up. You know, you're conscious and responsible and not coughing on people and things. But now we're talking about COVID. People are scared. You sneeze once, even if you have an allergy, somebody's going to be scared. Yeah, there's so personal the accountability that needs to happen for sure. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, you have to, you, you know, we have to be more responsible when it comes to that. And that's why I brought the dentist thing in to, to play. So you were asking, uh, tell a little bit about what we're doing. It's still in the works. I'm still building it. Things are changing by the day, as Monica mentioned earlier. Of course, the information is coming out all the time. Things need to be updated on a regular basis. Um, I have a very good friend who I've shot videos, training videos for him. He does OSHA compliance training. So even when people have their, their uh, safety data sheets and they do uh, watch an OSHA video and they go through some level of training, generally I've worked in some of these environments, they still don't really know how to comply. And now their concerns are being compliant with laws and OSHA regulations. Ours are more just before the laws happen, we need to be responsible and be proactive for ourselves for our own safety. The safety for our talent, the safety for our crew, especially as Monica mentioned, producers are really holding the weight of a lot of this. And if you don't, don't hire producer, photographers yep. <laughs> would, would have this weight or director, DP, whatever that acronym is that we do come up with for that multiple person role would be ultimately responsible or at least even feel responsible. So how do we try and alleviate that a little bit? Education, I think, is key. And the more that we, we're not worried about just complying with a law that may or may not come about in our near future, but more compliant understanding how the disease is transmitted, being more up to date on this, having a safety officer on set, our name for it up to this point was infection control coordinator, infection control specialist. You know, I mean, medics are great, but like Monica said, medics may be busy at this time, but also medic generally, you know, is, is trained to, for someone, if there's something that happens on set, for them to manage that, how are you going to do that? And you're also wiping stuff down. It's almost two different roles, really. You know, if your budget is that tight, okay, it could be the same person, but that's cutting a corner a little bit, to be honest. With you. Where, where do you even begin to start to find somebody like that, whether it's, you know, what can uh, the community do to start getting more educated about these kinds of people that would be qualified? Obviously, they're not like have certain uh, certifications necessarily, but. Well, they can, they can. This, this is the thing. So uh, where I mentioned uh, a friend of mine, I started shooting his videos, his training videos, and I was chatting with him about a month ago. And that's when it dawned on me after producers like Monica and other producers mentioned, you know, what are we going to do on set? And they started having this dialogue a month ago. And I, I started talking to John and I said, listen, you know, what can we do? And, and we started coming up with the idea of training for this industry, which we've not really had, at least in the non-union side. And on the union side, you know, they have it, but primarily people's focus, I mean, I don't want to speak for everyone, but people tend to focus on um, more physical hazards, like, um, like I said, machine, operating machinery and things of that nature, or chemicals that may be on set. Which we'll still have to deal with chemicals on set if we're talking about cleaning products, though. Well, I'm sure that, you know, the uh, film industry is gonna have to have a new set of trainings. Yeah, well, have, exactly. Yeah. But um, we don't have unions that. So my point is that we need to have that as well. And, and I people, agree. And that's I mean, a good segue to let you guys know that I I just recently jumped on board um, a group of uh, amazing gals that have been working for the last four years on trying to formulate uh, a trade organization for us for for, mm -hmm. the, for the for us in the non union world. Um, and that it includes creating a universal terms and conditions uh, and also health and safety guidelines. So um, I, I feel very fortunate to have jumped on board um, and try to help this thing grow and establish. Uh, so Mary Brooks and Joy Asbury were the two gals that started this. Um, and I'm, you know, I, I, for a very long time, I feel the same. I feel like Samantha feels it's, you know, we are kind of like the, 
redheaded stepchild, you know, <laughs> oftentimes, mm -hmm. and we don't have the benefits and the protections that I think that we should have. Um, because we, especially nowadays, um, that shoots are no longer pure photo shoots. We're all, you know, the merging has happened years ago where we're doing a lot of video content and, and mm -hmm. still work. So, mm -hmm. you know, really the, they're, they're the differentiation between a motion set and our world, there's not a lot of difference there. Um, so I feel that we should have the protections in place to safeguard us. Uh, so that is something that is happening. And I think it's long overdue. There, there's long overdue. Begin with, with education, with at least for now, you know, our yeah. immediate future. I mean, we don't know how long it's going to take for these things to take place. So they, it, they have been in the works, which is awesome. Thank you yes. for that. Yes. Um, we, we do still need, I think, to, to beef up in education with, with things Absolutely. that we haven't done prior, and especially now with infection control. Even with physical has, honestly, you know, I, I've seen shoots where they're like, they're asking me, get on a cherry picker, and there's no safety harness, there's no, that is out of bounds with OSHA, that is not, that is not, <laughs> it's not actually legal to do, but on the still side, we do it and get away with it, and nobody's policing it, nobody, no OSHA control person is coming to our set and giving us a grade or a rating or a ticket for this but it's up to us to really police ourselves and I think with something that's crucial why not do some similar or same training that some of these other um, industries have already been doing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it maybe we don't need it to be as stringent as a dentist office but I was pulling somebody in um, to get this going who does do that kind of training for dentist offices because if he does that kind of strict training for that for they who's, who are in a high risk environment we're what's considered a medium risk environment. The only reason we're considered medium risk is primarily because of the lack of 100% six, six foot or two meter uh, physical distancing guidelines. You know, you make up artists is not gonna be able to do that. Certain talent's not gonna be able to do that. Certain situations right. that's not possible. Alternatively though, we would be more on the low risk scale, you know, with the exception of, like I said, makeup and, and these other things. So with medium risk, if we start learning how diseases transmit and ways to prevent this, that people in dentist offices are dealing with, I think we're on the right road to being prepared for having our sets to be compliant, if you will, or equally yeah. compliant. And that much is, more safe. Yeah, this, this uh, conversation obviously can go on all day, right? Um, and, you know, I want people to kind of take away something from this in the sense of like, what can they be doing to um, kind of understand how it can apply to their specific situation, right? And, and you know, what's coming to me is, is, you know, everybody should be getting in touch with a producer, getting in touch with, um, you know, learning, you know, go um, watch uh, Samantha's, uh, do her training or uh, be, be on, on uh, Thursday, um, because it's, it's gonna obviously be different for all of us. And I think it's gonna be more evident how all of these safety things can be applicable to you know each particular shoot. Um, Juliet, any other? We're kind of, we're um, almost uh, out of time here. Uh, time any flies. other? Any? <laughs> what's that? Time flies. I know. Right? So there's a couple of questions. Um, so I don't know which one we want to take, but there was one question that had to do with um, using somebody's own home has a location right now. Um, should they be including a fee? And do they need a, a permit the way that you would get a permit in other places? So there's that question. I'm just going to throw both and you can quickly answer them. And then there's a green question for Monica because you deal with green sets and how you're dealing with um, everything being disposable in this green time. So those are, there you go. Jim? You want I'll, to take the I'll field the first half of that question. Um, certainly um, shooting at home, um, shooting at home does not generally for one, in, if you're the homeowner or living in the house, they're not gonna require you to have a permit. Different districts have different uh, rules on that. It just really depends on where you live. I mean, some are of like within the city of Los Angeles, for example, it can be very restrictive, but I don't think anybody is going to call you if you're a lone photographer shooting in his or her studio for commercial work uh, it's not as though you're amassing parking outside of your door, for example. So I don't foresee that to be too much of an issue. Um, what was the other half of that? It was about green, uh, about uh, the fact that we are going to have to stock our shoots with 
uh, preferably sustainable uh, bowls or, you know, or of uh, uh, cutlery and stuff, uh, because we're going to have more waste, it should be sustainable waste, please. Uh, I think that it's, you know, that I, I'm a firm, uh, I kind of steadfastly have no, oh, no plastic on set rule. Um, so, you know, bringing, uh, having a dispensable, like water, water jug on set so people can fill up their own things. I do feel that we'll have to, um, assign tasks to our production support. So one person will be doing certain things. Um, and, and so I think that, you know, some certain costs will go up as a result, uh, for the, uh, because there'll be more trash. Uh, you know, I, you, we don't want to put it in a landfill, so best that it be sustain, uh, recyclable. Absolutely. Uh, another question um, around, uh, the, around law and liability. Um, you know, there, there's obviously a lot of talk about having crew uh, sign release uh, waivers, um, and, and that's something we're going to, it's, it's a big conversation as well. Um, to, to make sure the obviously the client uh, and the producer and everyone isn't um, uh, held liable. Um, and, and of course, we on the flip side, you know, we have to make sure that the client is, you know, taking all precautions as well. And there needs to have, be a conversation, you know, with the client and, and you know, w that's a whole nother uh, thing to, to, to discuss around if the client, you know, wants a certain, the set to be a certain way um, but, uh, is, have, I know you said you got off your, the phone with your insurance, Monica. Yeah, he, um, so as we all know, our insurance doesn't currently cover a pandemic. Uh, it is, this is a force majeure. It does not cover this pandemic. Um, I was on the phone with TCP, uh, just this morning, actually, just to see about updates. And he let me know that there's a pandemic risk uh, insurance act that's being bandied about and he's sort of going to keep his finger on the pulse as far as when that thing comes uh, comes to fruition but that is the recent thing and I think Juliet you probably posted that here in the notes so you guys can read about it yourself but it is hopeful that obviously that for the future um, that is something that we will want to have in play uh, but yeah so I, I the idea of having um, Having folks sign something uh, be when they come, I, there's there's a personal accountability that has to happen. Like like when Samantha was talking about, you know, if if we have a medic on set taking thermot taking temperatures, this person could still be affected with COVID and come to set even with not showing a temperature right then. Uh, and it would be really hard to trace it back to the set yeah, that I got COVID on this set because we're exposed every day. If you walk outside, you're exposed. Uh, but at least having, um, adhering to guidelines, having a crew, crew sign something when they come and sign something when they leave saying that, yes, all the safety protocols were in place. Um, I think that can't hurt. And it can be part of our like package that we bring to the table uh, when we uh, get back to business. I, if I may add to that, I spoke with um, my lawyer yesterday about that, actually. I wasn't okay. able to get TCP on the phone. <laughs> They're busy. Um, but we were discussing I, a, a template or, you know, a release form for everyone. And it might even differ per state, depending on, because some, some places, even if they sign a release form, they still could potentially sue. It's not going to really keep somebody 100% from trying to sue you over a COVID case, although it would likely get thrown out, we were discussing because of everything, Monica, you just said about trying to um, point, if it was one COVID case out of a set of 20 people, you're yeah. not going to ever be able to say that it happened on that set unless the set lasted for 19 days and they right. stayed in that room the entire time, which we know is not gonna happen. So the only way that that would potentially be a big issue if there were an outbreak on the set. Right. So if there's an outbreak, then now that's looking more liable, like that happened on the set. But one or two people out of 20 that showed up positive when they're taking the subway or their own car to work, there's no way to prove that. <clears throat> now, does that prevent them entirely from trying to sue? Not necessarily. Does it mean it'll go thrown out? Most likely. But I, 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 we can stay in touch about um, uh, what this law firm says, but they're looking into it and into something that might if it can be blanketed over all states or if it needs to be state specific as far as the release form is concerned. 
look forward to hearing how that unfolds. Mm -hmm. So that conversation was just yesterday. So yeah, yeah. Well, good. Um, yeah, where to begin? It's and it's uh, about time. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, uh, for for joining. This is the beginning of the conversation, and uh, I encourage you to uh, get on Samantha's uh, webinar on Thursday, right? It's an, it's an intro to the course that we're proposing, the, 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 the training that we're offering. Mm -hmm. you know, so we wanted to let everybody at least know, because this is all new, especially for our industry. Like I said, if you work in the medical office, that's not new. You have this training. It's, besides OSHA, you have a consultant discuss it to you. We haven't done that before. So a lot of people, it's just very foreign to them. So it's more of an introduction to what that training is. It would be spe uh, specifically for infection control and more geared towards our industry specifically as well. And they get to meet John who would be heading, spearing that up because he has 20 years experience. Great, great. So yeah, we'll have that information available. Uh, definitely on the, we'll send out an email tomorrow and then uh, Juliet put up a link for everybody. Yes, yeah, so uh, we have the link on here and we'll put it in the email. And then also there's a APA webinar. A APA LA is doing one with producer on Thursday. So it's Ask Stern Reps and APA LA. They'll be interviewing a producer to continue this conversation on Thursday as well. So thank Sweet. you so much, everybody. Uh, we're going to get through this together um, yeah. and keep supporting each other and call anybody if you need need help uh, if you're working on shoots coming up if you're in any of those states that are actually opening <laughs> i mean gosh that's a whole nother conversation um but uh stay home. <laughs> stay home right um so okay stay safe everybody thanks for joining us and thanks, guys. see you next week thank Bye. you Peter. thank you yeah thanks a pleasure see you next time okay stay safe Bye.